Welcome to the Mad Mom Luke's. My name is Muhammad. I'm here with my two co-hosts, Armor and Sim. Today we have a very special guest, uh, Muhammad Shirazi. He's the director of, of Islamic Oasis, which is a national and international organization that does works and projects in various countries, such as Somalia, Syria, Mali, among others. Uh, we're very lucky to have him here, actually. Uh, Muhammad, welcome. Thank you. It's very Muhammad. nice to have you. I heard a lot about you, man. Um, you're doing very big projects and everything. Uh, let's talk about Syria. I mean, Syria is in the news a lot. Um, how'd you get involved with that? You were actually you used to you were going to Syria before it was uh, before how many years ago? No, no, I was never in uh, Syria before the war or before the revolution. Uh huh. Um, obviously, who doesn't know Syria as far as from the Islamic history perspective? <laughs> I mean, you guys are talking about Mamluks, and who doesn't know this area, right? But, uh, no, I was never, before the revolution, no. And after the revolution, since the revolution started, I've been in Aleppo, inside Syria twice, and uh, on the borders uh, four different times. So Turkey, so you have Gaziantep, you have uh, Rehanli, you have, uh, uh, so I've been inside Aleppo, for instance. Uh, I went all the way to Idlib. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, uh, Syria is... Uh, you've been in there when the war is raging. Yeah, yeah. There's bombs yeah, yeah, being dropped all over you. Yes, yes, yes. I mean, many times. I've uh, every time. I've actually, the first time I got into Syria um, was uh, I, I. I don't know how much you guys are following this, especially the Geneva thing. Right? I mean, the whole Geneva one, Geneva two, Geneva three, and so when I went there, it was about the Geneva two. Uh, these are the peace accords for our listeners who are not paying attention to right. This, so. Okay. What was happening was you had uh, uh, Aleppo at the time before I got there. Aleppo wasn't as it wasn't being hit as much. Now, when I got there, the most severe bombing started in in, in Aleppo, the most severe bombing, and it was because the people were kind of being forced to accept Geneva Two Accords at the time. So they had to kind of, I mean, like what you see today, right? You're starving people to death in uh, in twist their arm. Yeah, twist, arm. twist them this way. Before it was twist them through barrel bombing, through uh, you know all kinds of different torture and all kinds of different things. And now you see starvation. But at that time in Aleppo, it was barrel bombing. It was one of the uh, latest. Yeah, can you explain bar- bar- barrel bombs? Because a lot of Muslims don't understand what a barrel bomb is. They just think it's something um, that they hear in the news and they just ignore it. But explain the, how devastating that 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 type of device is. So a barrel bomb, uh, it's basically what the name says. It's a barrel full of all kinds of explosives and all kinds of, uh, uh, you know, you have uh, metal and, and, and sharp metal and, uh, you know, nails and all kinds of full of TNT. And uh, the way it is just dropped anywhere, you, there's no way to actually target a place. So what, what and, there are, and uh, the, the Syrians don't really have anything that says, okay, we can target a place with a bomb. So you, they just go up there, uh, and then you drop this bomb. Wherever it falls, it falls. But the thing was to... Their, the purpose of this bomb is to terrorize. I mean, to create as much... Um, mass uh, devastation. Mass devastation as you can. So at that time I was there, I mean, uh, you had... I mean, I remember one night, uh, or actually one morning, uh, four barrel bombs literally around the hospital that I was in. One time, you know, literally right, left, front of the hospital and behind the hospital. And the, and the target was actually the hospital itself. So, and the reason why is because uh, doctors are obviously considered also uh, part of the rebellion. Yeah, I mean, uh, they're part of the rebellion. I mean, they are uh, people, I and mean, the, the regime wanted... They're walking wants around with death. a target on their back, on their backs. In, in yeah. most, most war zones, aren't doctors considered just, uh, you know, neutral? I mean, why? Nobody really goes for doctors, right? Uh, well, in Syria, that's not the case. Uh, in other war zones, for instance, you know the thing is the weapons. When you drop these weapons, right? When you whether you use missiles or barrel bombs, whatever, they don't really differentiate between a doctor or not a doctor. No, of course, right? I mean, even Mogadishu, for instance. When I was in Mogadishu, hospitals were targeted even at that time. I mean, I remember I met, I met a doctor. He had done ten thousand surgeries. Hmm. Ten thousand surgeries in his lifetime. And uh, he said, uh, you know, imagine 10 years of, 10 or 20 years of war in Mogadishu. 
And he said, <clears throat> I can take out a bullet, for instance, uh, in my sleep. This is not an issue. To the point, I remember uh, the American, uh, you know, the army actually invited him to come and, and give presentations. But he, he just said, he said no, because he had no time. Even this is, I'm talking about, uh, you know, when things actually calm down. He said, no, my people need me there and they stay there. And it doesn't matter, you know, this, even though you're talking about people who are uh, some of the best professionals, uh, they, they are, they would be uh, multi-billionaires here in this country. They are the people who write the books. They are the people who invent things. These are the people who actually invented different forms of surgeries because of the amount of experience that they have. But they don't leave these places. They say, no, our people need us. We need them there. Describe uh, the hospitals. Uh, I don't think a lot of people understand what the hospitals are like, the situation, uh, how bad it is over there. So I remember I'll give you, uh, you know, the first time I got to a hospital, it was in Maria. Maria is about... Uh, and this is Syria. This is Syria. Okay. Uh I got, this is from uh, Turkish border. It's about half an hour, 40 minutes from the Turkish border. Maybe half an hour. Uh, and when I got there, uh, so they took me to a ha- makeshift hospitals. There are no more hospitals that you, what you know of. So you have uh, makeshift hospitals. Uh, schools have been turned into hospitals. Uh, wedding halls, huge wedding halls, huge, really? uh, everything that you, 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 because you have massive, you know, massacres going on. You don't have like where one or two or three, you you have a massacre. So when I got there, uh, there was a bomb that was dropped on a school killing 62 kids. Oh. And uh, you're talking about ages from eight to 12. All of them were killed. And I actually have one of the videos, if you go on uh, Islamic Oasis Save a Life campaign, you can actually see that video that I was, I, I went to the site uh, about half an hour or hour after the bombing took place. So, and you see people, you know, taking things out of the, the rubble that's just there. So the hospital, when you go there, I mean, they have to, every time, the hospitals have to improvise because they don't, they don't have the beds they need, they never have the, the resources they don't have, uh, you know, even for instance, uh, uh, the, the you know the 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 tools that average doctors need in order to do perform surgeries. Right? Mm-hmm. Anesthesia is uncommon, even to the point I remember one time I was in Turkey, and we were trying to figure out how to get some medicine inside. Uh, first things, and I was trying to take some pictures. Every time I go, I take pictures of the work we do, <laughs> so people know what's going on. They said, "No, you can't take picture of this specific medicine." I said, why not? I said, no, no, man, this is anesthesia. This is everybody wants it. The regime will target, make sure if they take a, if I take a picture of it and I put it on Facebook saying, hey, this is what we have done. And if they see, let's say, for sure they're following what you're putting on because you're always doing medical work. Uh-huh. And the regime, if they see that medicine you have, they'll figure out somehow where you took that picture and they'll come, there might be a situation here. Wow. You're talking about inside Turkey. So th- these guys, e- you know, this is the kind of situation they're working. Now, imagine inside. This is I'm talking about outside Turkey. How, that's how people's, and inside Turkey, how people are, how scared people are to, to, and then imagine inside Syria, uh, what the situation of the hospitals are. So you go there and the moment I, so in Mara is a massacre. You have kids being bought in the in the ambulances. Ambulances are are also. I think the life shelf life of an ambulance was at that time was about three months, two months. Uh, they won't last. And so even when we we actually bought in some ambulances at one time, and even the ambulances we started uh, when I bought them in the beginning. What do you mean you bought in ambulances? What do you mean so by we that? We raise funds. We would raise funds and we would take in ambulances. We buy them in 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 Turkey. And we took them inside. And Islamic in, Oasis is the one that does all this. <coughs> yes, yeah. So wow. we bought them with SAMS. We work with an organization called SAMS, which is also a non-profit organization. So we are American also a non-profit medical society. Medical society. Yeah. So we always work with an organization that is tax exempt and they are... Uh, Beautiful. So we... Ambulances, uh, yeah. We took ambulances inside. And then they we figured, well, you know what? The best way to do it is to just... Uh, sp- instead of spending 12000 on an ambulance, you, you buy an ambulance, you just buy a regular van, an average van, and transfer them, you know, transform it into an ambulance because we know it's not going to last more than two weeks, three weeks, four weeks because regime was, dire, you know, targeting ambulances, literally right. targeting hospitals and ambulances and massages and schools because the uh, point was to massacre and devastate and terrorize. So that you get to a hospital and you have children 
crying, children dying. You have people I've seen. I remember one time I was holding a one they bought in they constantly they're bringing in victims and one I was holding the the doctor was holding on the other side. Literally, I mean the guy was split in half almost. Yeah, you can yeah, see yeah, it from yeah. here to you know, from his head down to almost his chest is like and and almost you know that this guy's gonna go finish his time is over. Wow. So you know, trauma, I don't know if you guys know trauma for, you know, doctors, they put in these pens, they have, uh, they'll put it on the head of the person, how long this person is going to go, whose priority, if they know somebody's going to mm. go, they'll give him a shot and say he's going to go in three, four minutes or one hour, half an hour. Now you're, now you, you got to explain to us how you're dealing with all this. You're a 35 year old man, not, not very, uh, not an old man who's been, you know, battle scarred and been through a, Every, this is all new to you. I mean, relatively. You've been to Somalia before, but this I mean, is a live... I was, in, I was also in Palestine for three months. Okay. Right. Uh, this was when I was 19 years old. And uh, so that also uh, prepared, that's also prepared me, uh, you know, situation. I was in Gaza for one week. I spent one week in the refugee camps there yeah. for one week. And I was in Khalil and Jerusalem, you know, Al-Quds. And but this areas. is a live battlefield, though. The, the, yeah, this was live. I mean, even, uh, you know, you never, you can never prepare for this. This is not something... What's going do. on in your head? How, how, you're, you have a family. You, know, <laughs> you have a family. Yeah, alhamdulillah. And um, children and, and wife who loves yeah. you and uh, parents who love <laughs> you. How how do you gather this courage to go there? How, how do you gather yourself to to go in? This is something that a lot of people a lot of people want to aspire towards, you know, doing refugee work and things like that. But they want to know how people like you see this hurdle and they jump over this hurdle because everyone, a lot of people have families, right? Now they want to do this work, but there's something that stops them. A lot of it is my wife, my kids, right? And that's obviously a concern that you have too. What is your pushing point? And if you can be like as specific as possible, because this is inspiring to other people also. It's inspiring to all of us. So how? What is that? What is that thing? Or what are those things? Of course, uh, you know. Number one, uh, this is tawfiq from Allah Azza wa Jal. This is tawfiq from Allah Azza wa Jal. This is and have them in fadl Rabbi. This is uh, favor from Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. There is no question about it. And uh, uh, you know. I think my parents, uh, you know, my dad was very much involved both even in India, and uh, your dad was in medicine. Uh, yeah, he was. A, he was a doctor. He did a lot of work in Iran for ten years. He did a lot of work in, in India, and then also, uh, you know, he worked here too. But I remember one time, uh, this is before I got married. I don't know if this is nineties when Bosnia was going on. So, I remember it was the day of Eid. And uh, we all went to, you know, here, Islamic Foundation to pray. And uh, we came back and we were eating and uh, they were showing what was happening at the time in Bosnia. So you had huge lines. Who was showing? Is us? No, no, this on CNN. We came okay. back home and we were just eating after Salah and everything. Yeah. You know, family complete, coming together, kind of eating his yeah. eat, eat, uh, lunch or whatever. And then we were watching CNN at the time. And they were showing lines of people, just lines, huge lines of people trying to somehow make it to the other side of the border. Somehow trying to make it, somehow make it alive. Lines with women holding their babies. So my dad just said, uh, I mean, he he just broke down and he said, I mean, what is this? Here we are with our families eating lunch, prayed in peace and whatever. And here you have families, hundreds of hundreds mm. of thousands of families just... So that's one thing, um, you know, parents play a big deal, big role in, in this. And after that, you know, of course, uh, your parents and then my wife played an amazing role in this. I mean, my, my wife is the one that has actually forced me over and over to go back. And wow. she's asking me to go back, which I might be within the next few weeks, I might be going back. Mashallah. So, so Allah. it's... Uh, it helps yeah. to have a spouse, which is very Islamic, mashallah, yes. and reminds you of that. Yes. SubhanAllah. Yes. I mean, we have children. So do the Muslims around the world. I mean, this is the meaning of brotherhood. This is the meaning of Islam. This is what's beautiful about this deen is that, you know, the the, the meaning of, of you, when you what you up, care for yourself, you care for your brother. The hadith is. Where, where you wake up, the, uh, the Prophet ﷺ said, the man who wakes up in the morning and doesn't have concern for the affairs of the ummah, he's not one of us. Look, Sheikh, I mean, if, this is the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, uh, like what you just mentioned. And I think people, I don't consider people who are not working to change the situation to be alive people. 
they're not alive. Because how can you be alive uh, when you have masses of people m- massacred in front of you? Right. I mean, you, you're dead. I don't consider in that sense. Yes, I know. In that mean. sense, that you have, a, you have. A, I mean, how do you consider yourself to be alive? Well, you can't stand up for against oppression. You cannot stand up in front of oppression. You don't see, so, you know, you see wrong happening in front of you. You don't even say a word. That right. hey, I mean, this is what I mean. I mean, if you if you, you have to be alive to feel pain. If you if right. somebody doesn't feel pain, you say this guy is either dead or the, he's, he's retarded. Or he's not. He's not finished. I, I think what it is. I think over here we're just you know you see this on the news every single time. I mean, I notice with me. I mean, it's just one of those things like you see it all the time. It's just like. Ah, uh, you know this again, or you know, ah, uh, this is happening. Um, and then I think after a while, you just get desensitized to it. I mean, it's just like, man, this is overwhelming. I mean, there's too much going on for me to do anything about it. I mean, um, I don't know if anyone else feels like that. I really do feel like that. I feel I'm too small to do anything about it. But I mean, look at you here, though. I mean, you actually, you're doing something about it. Well, we are doing. It's not just. I mean, I, I know you're saying you're here, but look, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil I mean, we have had. A lot of good friends that have always pushed each other. That's another thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, Your parents, your family, your wife, children, and then the people that you grow up with. That makes a big difference. But I I want to, I mean, uh, you said something. You said, well, you know what? You kind of get numb to it or you just kind of say, hey, I'm too small to do anything or I'm, uh, you know, oh, here goes Syria now and could be, uh, who knows what's next. Mm -hmm. It could be Jordan. Who? The thing is, you can look at it that way, or you can say, if I don't do anything now, Jordan will be next. You can say, if I don't do anything now, uh, Lebanon will be next. Or Allah knows what, Makkah will be next, Saudi and in general. Anything is next. That's because we're, you're, when, 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 this is the attitude we have now, is that, well, you know, it's just uh, one after the other. But you know what, I, I want to just mention one more thing here. We were having conversation with a few refugees just last night. We had a dinner with the refugees. And, and I said uh, to the brother, I said, did you ever think what's happening in Syria would ever happen? He said, no, brother, we would never, you know. But I said, Palestine, for instance, is the neighbor. There are massacres going on there. How many massacres? You know, I mean, Janine to Darya Sin, Allah knows how many massacres. So many massacres took place. But I don't think the people of that, let's say Damascus, the people of Aleppo, the people of the Syria in general, ever thought that it will come to them. Tables will be turned in that way, where uh, complete hell will come to them. And what people of the Muslims of Palestine are dealing with for the last 60 years. But Allah turned the tables. Why? Because the people of Syria for years maybe thought, ah, who knows, what can I do? We're too small. That goes from an individual level to, to a group level to nation level. Same thing I, I'm telling the Muslims now of Bangladesh. If you sit around and watch what's happening in Burma, take example of what's happening in Syria. And exactly, literally, they are watching the Muslims of Burma being slaughtered every single day. When I, because I deal, and this is not, you know, I'm stories I'm making up. I deal with the Muslims of Burma every single day, every day. I de- deal with their children coming from back home. I see their situations. I, go to their homes, I hear their stories, I meet families who've spent three years in jails in Thailand, for instance, just to try and to protect themselves and they just run over a border and they get arrested because it's illegal to cross the border, but if they go back, they're going to be slaughtered by an army sitting on the other side. People, their children were drowned in front of them. Many of them were in boats trying to come to the other side, for instance, in Bangladesh, and then they were turned, and then the the Burmese army just shot at them and killed them. But the people, when if you don't do anything, it will come to you. It will come to you. So that's that's in the dunya. But then there is akhirah, and that's what makes us unique. Is this is why we cannot just sit around? Is because in the akhirah, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala will ask us, "What did you do?" And you better have a good answer. Mm. You better have a good answer. What are we going to say there? And especially the Quran, Allah says, "Atabiru ya ul absar." Take heed, O oh eyes that see. You you see every day what's happening. What did you do? I'm not saying to everyone get up and go to Syria. I'm not saying get up and do go, go and work in this place or that. Do no. But what are you doing? Something enough that you can say to Allah Azza wa Jal. At the least, we can say, "Ya Allah, I tried my best." 
Because that's all we need to say. We, we as of Ummah, we know we are responsible. We are responsible on the Day of Judgment. And people who are responsible cannot just say, ah, oh, it's not my problem. We just can't. We don't have that. Other nations might have that. Other people might have that uh, luxury. luxury. We just, we don't have that. And that's what makes us unique. We don't have that luxury number because we have to answer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You might avoid it and have the most luxurious lifestyle in this world and you might whatever. But on the day of judgment, there is Jannah and there is uh, Jahannam. So, you know, this is why, I mean, that's, these are the things that, that push us day and night saying, hey, man, Allah is going to ask. Allah is going to ask. Um, you were saying that, uh, you know, these guys, these refugees from Syria, they never imagined that it would happen to them, right? Um, <coughs> it, I mean, is everyone like that? I know, I know you don't see much action from the governments. I mean, you know, the Saudi government, I don't think, I don't know how much they do to help uh, uh, the Palestinians, the Syrians or anyone. Is it, Not everyone's like that, right? I mean, I know, I know there are people, especially people on the border that try to do some, right? Or no? Well, of course. I mean, because people are doing something, People, because people have, they've said we need, to, we have to do something. I mean, look, the whole revolution is because people said the whole point of the revolution. I mean, it's been going on for five years. Is because people have yeah. said we're not gonna, we're not gonna sit around. And uh, Syria, you know, before I go, just ask me this: if I, uh, I wanted to say something. Is I remember after one massacre, I was in Aleppo, and this time I was actually inside Aleppo. And the same day, I went from Mare. I was telling you guys the story of Mare and when the kids were massacred. So about two hours later, I was in Aleppo. In the city of Aleppo, when you look, when you enter it, you just see, you know, you just see that this is this is war zone. This is, you know, you you just see clouds of just, you know, it, it's it's uh, dirt and. And, uh, just debris all over in the air. Yeah, I mean it's it's you know it's like fog, and you see it, but it's not because of actual fog; it's because of the debris. The yeah. Debris of fog. So I got to the hospital. Uh, <clears throat> that night there was a massacre. Uh, because uh, remember, I told you in the beginning that they were really they had really started to bomb uh, Aleppo at that time. So one doctor he started crying and he started uh, screaming and. So we went outside the hospital because it was just it was too overwhelming. Even uh, so, I and I said that to the doctor, and he said, "We are paying for the price of not doing anything for our brothers. Mm. We are paying the price now." Mm. I mean, so that's you know people have realized, and historically from Syria, for instance, in nineteen eighties when Hama massacre. Remember, Hama massacre happened nineteen eighties by this guy, you know, uh, Bashar Assad's father, Hafizul Assad for. He killed 80,000 people, right? At that time, the people of Hama, when they revolted, the cities around did not answer. The cities around did not come to support. They wa- they saw, yeah, even they wanted to, but circumstances, people said, I have children and I have this and I have that. Mm-hmm. Like and 80,000 people were killed. <clears throat> Blood was spilled and there was nothing, nothing came out of it. I mean, nothing in a sense that it was not a successful revolt because support did not come the way it should have. Mm-hmm. So now, at this time, the people in Syria, they learned from that experience. So this is why they say when the revo- revolution or the revolt started in, uh, rebellion started in, uh, in Dara, uh, they realized, look, this has to go throughout the country. We cannot stop. If not, this will be just another Hama. And people started saying, we have to help, we have to support, and they started coming from all over. So people have learned that if we don't do anything, it's going to come. And alhamdulillah, because of that, this is going on. Now, you asked about, uh, okay, the Muslims of Saudi are helping. There's no question about it. The Muslims of uh, even Palestine are helping. The Muslims of Jordan are helping. Muslims of Uzbekistan are helping. The Muslims of Chechnya are helping. The Muslims of uh, Jordan are helping. In what way, though? I mean, me. I'm just, I'm just a normal guy. I haven't, I don't hear much about they, this. Whatever skills that they have, they are bringing to the table. Whatever skill that may you're be. talking about, individuals themselves, individuals who are doing, see right? something wrong, like yourself, yes. and they go, they go, right? They are but you're leading to something. I felt like you were leading to something. Right. I, I mean, that. but are the governments helping? The governments are helping, depending on uh, who tells them to help. Hmm. I mean, look at it. Yeah, right now, Madaya happened. You know, starvation taking place in Madaya. 40,000 people under siege. 
hundreds of thousands of and children. And where is Madaya? So Madaya people know? now, if you have uh, in in very really close to Damascus, mm-hmm. Syria, it's a city. Uh, now they are going to siege Western Ghouta. Uh, Eastern Ghouta has been under siege. Homs has been under siege. UN, for instance, knew about it for months that people are dying. And today, it was in Telegraph, a newspaper said, you know, UN, for instance, knew very well about the amount of massacres that were taking place or the, the starvation, I'm sorry, uh, taking place in this area and when, what could be, what the ramifications will be if they don't do anything. But they waited. Why? The, the, because, uh, obviously, you, uh, I and mean, UN doesn't move without the US asking them to move. Mm. So, interest doesn't matter how many people starve to death. Well, people are seeing that. People around the world see that. That you are willing to starve our babies to death, uh, you know, to get what you want. Your interest is more important uh, and it's, it's more precious than, uh, than the lives of our babies. Than our daughters, than our sons, than our, yani, our lives. So help these and then, okay, what help have they bought? Oh, they have accepted refugees. Some people come and they say, oh, look at the amount of refugees Turkey has accepted, uh, accepted, or uh, look at the amount of the, the so-called Saudi government has accepted, all these people accept. Do you think really I mean, the people of uh, Syria really care about how many refugees these countries have accepted? What they are looking for, this war can be over in one day. The war, the bare bombing of people, the starving of, starvation of people, kidnapping of people, sniping people. At one point when I was there, they were sniping people, the women who were pregnant specifically. Wow. I mean, it became a famous story, story in Time magazine, for instance. You actually, when they started targeting women, pregnant women, oh. I don't know if you saw that very famous story. You can actually no. see the picture of the bullet that hit directly in the stomach of the woman, on the womb of the woman, and uh, what happened to the baby, for instance. Very famous story. You can actually go and look that up. This can be stopped. This whole thing can be stopped. This government, this, uh, instead of that, you have groups who are being supported. Mass on massive level, you have Hezbollah, you have Iran, you have, you know, all these big, uh, you know, people with huge amounts of resources are coming in and slaughtering and massacring people, and then oh, refugees, oh, we accepted two thousand, twenty thousand refugees, and we are supposed to be happy about that. Why will we be happy about that? Imagine when you can stop the whole thing. It's in your hand to stop the whole thing. You even put a no-fly zone at least. Even no fly zone, and people have been asking for that for so long. Just put a no fly zone. You don't, you don't look. You don't even have to accept refugees if you put put together the no fly right. zone. Right? right. You don't have to accept no, <laughs> but no, you no 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 slaughter them, no kill them, no drop bombs on them, all kinds of stuff. Man, to, you have twenty thousand, if not thousands, of people rotting in prisons of uh, uh, Syria, but no one wants to say a word about that, even though. Yeah, photos and all kinds of things and presentations have been done even by this UN and human rights organizations or whatever what happened to you know uh, we have to you know there's going you know human rights and where are all these organizations so when you ask question why are they are they helping obviously the muslims in these countries and even non muslims they're helping they are trying their very best to do what they can at, as individuals as organizations but that's not what the people of Syria need. They are asking, where are these governments with huge amounts of resources watching our our our, our families starve to death? So, and think about one, just one more thing: if you can have convoys of trucks come inside Madaya, for instance, which happened last week, and they can bring in food, why couldn't they bring in food? Let's say three weeks before. What stopped them three weeks before that they changed their mind three weeks after? Well, as you know, 28th, I think January 28th is the date set for the Geneva, the, the next Geneva coming up. So you starve people to accept, somehow they need to accept the policies that are being set by, by the Western uh, countries who are going to set up the new. They want the people to say either you starve or you accept what we want. So even when they're allowing aid, that allowance of aid is also, there is an interest for it. And I'll wow. give you another example. In Homs, for instance, when they allowed aid to come in, and this is UN will tell you that, and people who are in that area will tell you that, when they allowed aid to come in, aid is being used as a strategy 
as uh, by the Bashar government because UN aid and all these, uh, you know, food, uh, world food and all this cannot come in without Bashar saying you can come in. It has to go through the government. This type of aid, UN aid official, has to come through Bashar government. So at one point, at, at what point, what they did was they let in, they bought in the food. So the food is then directed to the areas the Bashar government wants it to, which is usually its own soldiers. And then all of the food that was gone or expired was sent to Homs. Hmm. And UN knew about this. So you're talking about institutions that are setting that, that that were set up in order to supposedly protect human rights. You know, human rights. Uh, this. Uh, the problem is for the people inside Syria, and I think the Muslims are all around. They see this as nothing but hypocrisy. But in reality, they know that this will happen to them. But uh, when you when you talk about uh, Saudi government and all these governments, these are. <laughs> I mean, it's laughable what they're doing. Mm-hmm. So, w- what do individuals do? What do you do yourself? Like when you go there, um... I think number one thing when we when we go in there, you know, there's there, we work on different projects. Uh-huh. So our whole goal, there's so much needed there, man. I mean, there is. You're talking about a war zone. You everything is needed from simple blankets to, to, you know. So you really have to prioritize. And so I spoke to many agencies. I spoke to a lot of agencies. Believe me. Uh, inside both inside Turkey in, and uh, and here in the U.S. And then we decided that medic- medicine was the best way that we can help. So we started working with SAMS. We started working with you know uh, you know agencies that SAMS worked with works with inside inside Syria and and Turkey to get medical aid inside. That includes uh, MRI machines. That includes uh, uh, you know uh, ambulances, medicine, anything that you can think of that we could do to support medical we did that so we would buy it in turkey we would buy uh whatever equipment doctors would ask for surgical instruments we would buy those things and we would send them inside hospitals or i myself wanted to take it inside because especially we want to make sure people know where their money is going mm-hmm. right i mean i want them to know this is what we promised and this is what we'll deliver and when you go say. in do you go in with the name of islamic oasis or is that Yes, yes. Or I mean, do you just go in as an individual? <coughs> no, no. We go in as Islamic Oasis, but we go in as Sam's. I mean, I go. You know, you we have to go through legal borders. Yes, they have to know what we do. So we have our paperwork. I have my letters both here and there. And when I come back, details of uh, what we have done, what we are doing, why we are there, um, all of that is there. But of course, no one, no one uh, gives you guarantees of safety. Yeah. I mean, that doesn't give you safety. That just gives you safety in a sense that uh, you get kidnapped, you get kidnapped. You, because you get shot, you get shot. So That's what do you do to protect yourself? I remember when you went to Somalia, you had to hire some people. Do you do that everywhere? No. I mean, uh, because, you know, <laughs> in Syria, I mean, you're on your own once you get in. There is no one. There is no protection of any kind. Because hmm. yeah, no I remember kind. when you were talking we are, about... We have our ambulances, which is actually worse. <laughs> Because the ambulance it's, an open target. Are, it's a big target. It's bigger. I mean, you, at least if you're and uh, so uh, ambulances was uh, there's only one road to Aleppo. Oh no! It's only one road. It's oh one. no! So, <laughs> so it's is, so uh, easily trackable. And it's bomb. They bomb it every single day. So you probably there's probably parts of the road that you can't even use. You just have yes, to go on the ground course, somewhere. Yeah. I've taken pictures and I've put it online. You can see when the barrel bomb falls, what happens to that part of the uh, you know whether it's the street or that area, what happens. I mean, I remember one time a barrel bomb fell. Uh, I got there, alhamdulillah, and I got there about ten minutes, maybe twenty minutes after when it fell. So the hospital that I was going to visit, the hospital. So the thing fell on the other side. You know, you have a hospital and then you have the street. So the bomb fell on the other side of the street opposite of the hospital but the 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 force i mean it took out one i mean it you know the the sharpnel went through the first wall went through the windows destroying the windows and you you can see inside the rooms where the sharpnel was hit oh. alhamdulillah no one was killed that day but we were supposed to be there half an hour subhanallah azawajal so this is something uh, you know uh, this is the force of bear bombs you're dealing with but there's no safety there's no safety there's no kind of uh, you you go in there and 
you just pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He accepts your efforts and, and you don't even think about it. Right? I remember uh, what do you think about when you go in there. The only thing you're thinking about is you have a job to do. You got to get it done. You know, it's it's interesting you said that. You said, uh, alhamdulillah, no one was killed that day. I mean, it's kind of, it's one of those, and you said it so casually too. Yeah, I mean, can you imagine saying that here? I like, know. oh, you know, alhamdulillah, no one died today. I know. It's, it's I mean, a, it's unfortunate you have to see it so much, but, um, and the reason why I asked that question is I remember you said when you went to Somalia, and I mean, I'm, I'm trying to recall, but you said that there were a lot of humanitarian organizations like yourself, but when they were taking in supplies, they were leaving it at some area and some border hoping or paying people to take it in, but they weren't physically doing it. So you saw that, I guess, and this is what I recall, you saw this as a weakness and you wanted to be on the ground physically handing it to people. Can you tell us a little bit about that, how, how that kind of works out <coughs> as far as other organizations in yourself, Islamic Oasis? Yeah, of course. I mean, you know, uh, what happens is this. And I think this is this is, um, uh, and you don't have to mention names of other organizations. No, no, of course not. No, 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 no. no. I mean, everyone is doing what yeah. they can. Uh, of course. Now, what happens is this, and this is something that you'll see in all war zones, right? So, for instance, let's say Somalia, uh, the country that was playing the role of what's Turkey today. For instance, Turkey now in Syria, Turkey is playing the role of where things can pass through, you know, where uh, refugees can come in, yes. you buy things. So, so there's always that neighboring country that has to play that role. Like a uh, hub, kind like of. Like a what now? Like a hub? Like a hub. You just have to, it's kind of, it does that. In Somalia, it was Kenya. I see. Right? In uh, Afghanistan, it was Pakistan. Mm. So this is by design. This is by design. A country before, the whole it's prepared as well. So now you have, uh, for instance, for Iraq, right? You had Syria. Mm-hmm. Right, you had all the, you know, and Palestine, Kuwait and Palestine, Jordan. You have Jordan. You have these. So it's this well. They, they've got who are, the, the people who plan these things out. They have it well put together. They know exactly yeah. what has to happen. So, so, uh, but and also the people who are working on the ground or the people, you know, the relief organizations, humanitarian organizations, also know this and they know it very well because they've done it so over mm. and over and over. So. What I saw was a lot of the organizations were taking in aid, but not all the way inside. So mm. now uh, the idea, w- what they would do is they would hire people who are already working inside, give them the aid, let them take in aid inside. Okay. So that was happening. But does it always or, get through successfully? No, of course not. Okay. And then, then you have, or you have organizations that will work on the border because obviously huge amounts of refugees are coming to the border. So then you have to obviously work with them. You have to figure out ways to help those refugees. My goal was to go inside where no one wants to go no one wa- wants to work on the ground amazing right so you have uh mogadishu uh, and alhamdulillah i worked through an organization called some care at that time for somalia uh we went in uh, we went from here to kenya uh kenya to uh, with mogadishu at, at that time there's only one flight to mogadishu <laughs> really only one because they only have only one uh, runway <laughs> <laughs> there's only one one runway it's, it's, it's Turkish <laughs> Airlines was the one that was really? uh, it was only Turkish Airlines and and Turkish uh, are very well respected by the way in that area so and this is were you yeah. still with Islamic Oasis was it formed yes. yet? Okay. yes yes of course this is Islamic okay. Oasis we are formed and uh, so that was our first um, introduction to international wow. work and I'm just curious when you're in these zones because you go to the heart of these issues and obviously it's very amazing mashallah how do you get sleep in these times? How many hours a oh, day you do you sleep? sleep? Nah, it's the most like, when do you get sleep? sleep? You I can't imagine. <laughs> like I've traveled before and I went to places and just getting situated and you get a few hours of sleep. Literally, I, I mean, how, how do you how do you get sleep and where do you sleep? I'll give you an example. I When I was in Aleppo, uh, my wife was constantly in touch with me. I mean, it, it constantly when I got to Aleppo because constantly in touch means you go to a hospital. One of the things that uh, Sam's also did very well, and we was they made sure that there is um, that there is uh, Wi-Fi available okay. through satellites. Mm-hmm. So they had to make sure because that was the only way you could get information out. There was no other way. Right? There's not. So Wi-Fi had to be available satellite way. So when I now when I when I enter the border for the five six eight hours whatever before I get to the location I need to get to there is no I don't I lose contact with outside world wow 
So at one point, I mean, for hours, there's no contact with my wife. And she knows I'm in a war zone. Right? This guy's alive or dead. What's going on? So I got to Aleppo. I mean, and then I got to the hospital. And then the, in the hospital, you know, then you, once you get there, you're telling them what you can do, what you can bring in, what you have bought in, how, where this needs to be distributed, how, where this needs to be kept because medicine is big. Uh, it's gold. Yeah, it is. So we had to, we had to find the right places under certain buildings to put this medicine inside. Then I remember after that, it was uh, late, late at night. I just, I, and I've, I went to sleep. I went upstairs, one of these rooms, and I went to sleep. And because I had, I was connected to the Wi-Fi, my wife called. She, and then one of the doctors picked up my phone and said, hello, who is this? <laughs> this is his wife. Where is he? This guy is sleeping. He's gone. I'm not making him up. <laughs> oh, so you read Surat al This is what uh, practice that I did. I would read Surat al and go to sleep. Mm. If, if there's a barrel bomb that day, well, wow. that's a decision you and make. You said that so casually again. My wife, if, if I, it's as if you enter this yeah, it's zone. a whole different world. Yes. And now different. she doesn't know. And subhanAllah, I mean, yeah. and now you've gotten used to that. Yeah. That's yeah, subhanAllah. Yeah, that's, yeah, I mean, that's something yeah. amazing that, you know, if you have a strong family, then you kind of expect that. But that's amazing. How'd you get started in this? You know, we, as I said, uh, you know, uh, your environment builds you. Uh huh. The environment creates. I mean, the, 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 uh, friends. Uh, friends. Or? family uh what you see around you i mean i worked a lot in the local mosques and uh since all of us all of you guys know i mean we saw what happened in bosnia and we worked in the early that. 90s yeah you work with the refugees then we work with the uh, you know uh, european also at that before that it was also kashmir i don't know if you guys remember but the, the 90s were a crazy time right? right they helped a lot a lot of young muslims get very aware of what was going on in the world? I remember when ninety four, yeah, uh, Chechnya was going Chesnia, on too. Yeah, the, the war, early nineties, yeah. when the Bosnian war was happening, yeah. there were soldiers who would come in from Bosnia to our mosque, yeah, and they would show, they would try to raise funds, yeah. and they would have, uh, you know, a poster board with all these people who are injured and they need help, yeah. and. I remember that as being one of the most pivotal points in my life where I realized I have to do something. Yeah. I remember that that seeing that poster board and seeing that soldier from Bosnia. It was a Bosnian soldier. I still remember like yesterday. And he was wearing damn, a maroon beret, still wearing uh, military fatigues. And he's sitting there right outside the prayer hall as people are coming out. And he's asking for people's donations. And I didn't have money. I'm a kid. And I think I was 12 years old or something. And I saw that and I, I told my parents, we have to do something. And yeah, and, and I think a lot of kids all over the world, and I think we see it with the problem with the ISIS and whatnot, that a lot of these young Western kids, they just want to do something. They don't know exactly what they're getting into. Sometimes some of them do. I'm not saying, I'm not excusing everyone, but I think some people stop oppression. And, and they don't know how. They don't know how. Yeah. But I think what, what uh, Moga was asking was like, when did you, how did you think of the idea of starting the Islamic Oasis? Like, how did this happen? When did you decide not to go to med school? <laughs> 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 I never decided to go to med school. <laughs> you know, we did a lot of work in this country. Uh, one of the things was, you know, we started, we did a lot of work in the inner city, for instance. You know, I, uh, I don't know how true this is, but I heard you were actually one of the first, um, one of the first people to actually do a lot of work in the South Side here. Um, yeah, alhamdulillah, this was also a favor from Allah. Uh, and that's, that, that's what actually prepared us. You know, I, I, I consider South Side, inner city, a war zone. Uh, uh, you know, I mean, hmm. and with all these cops going crazy on the top of that. And then, you know, I remember one time, uh, in the South Side, well, we're going from Damascus to the south side. This is a good idea. <laughs> so you <laughs> call Chirac now. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Chicago, I, mean, Chirac. I mean, think about it. You have uh, these areas. You have uh, people said, "Oh, how do you work in war zones?" I said, "Man, I've been working in war war zones uh, eight years now, nine years." I mean, what do you mean? Why, why do you? How are you working in the war zones? For for yeah, our, our listeners out there, our brother Shazi works a lot with the inner city um, youth, uh, a lot of uh, African American communities who have been ravaged by gang violence. Um, yeah, so a lot of grassroots activities. And done. also refugees. So right. Islamic Oasis is actually doing international work, domestic work, more locally in Chicago, 
Um, yeah. So, but you were saying a story. Of uh, I remember one time uh, <laughs> uh, somebody got shot by the masjid. It's a very famous masjid there, Masjid Al Hassan. At the time, it was on Fifty First Avenue, uh, and he got shot. Everyone is there. It was Asr time. Was this so uh, so, like a mus- on a the prayer? street? Literally, somebody on the street. who's praying in the masjid. No, 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 no. Okay, there's a masjid. Okay. Uh, literally next door to the masjid. Mm-hmm. There's a bar and then just following that. Uh, guy got shot. When I got there, his body is there. He's mm-hmm. just laying there. Police comes in about half an hour or ten, whatever. They come in, they put those lines. Uh, it's very, like, it's happens all the time, right? So it's not like, uh, so the police know what to do. They come in late, they come in whatever. whatever. They took the guy yeah, out. It's south side. It's south side. Who yeah, cares? Yeah. yeah, who cares? Right. So, uh, <laughs> no, no, I'm saying that because that is, that, that, no, that's very true. true. That's the attitude, yeah. That's the attitude. Who cares? I mean, yeah. this has been happening for, I mean, you have a festival over there, you get 10 people massacred. I mean, think about it. Almost every, set of, you know, whether it's July 4th weekend, whether it's uh, uh, whatever weekends, you know, these famous uh, yeah. festivals or holidays, holidays come yeah. in. 10, 20, 30 people being killed is nothing. In it's innocent. a war zone. That is it's a war zone. It's nothing. Yeah. It's a war zone. I mean, there are more people killed in there than Iraq. The soldiers, the amount of soldiers oh. killed in Iraq is, is less than the people being killed in the inner city. These are wow. actual oh, uh, yeah. statistics, right? So That is crazy. Yeah. I mean, this is what happens. You have sometimes you had 30 people killed, 40 people killed. People, uh, they just kind of know. I remember if you go and I, it was like 10, 11 something at night. I, uh, one of the brothers over there, he said, uh, we got to go get something. He was looking for a bus pass. I said, let's just go over there, walk down to the street. It's two blocks down. And he said, no, no, it's too dangerous to walk at this time. Talking about 11 o'clock at night. Wow. Right? I mean, on Diwan, you go and grab a pan if you want at <laughs> 11 o'clock at night. You know, you go and have yeah. uh, food at my yeah. bathhouse, yeah. whatever. Over there, you can't go 11 o'clock at night. You're crazy. It's too dangerous. So we had to get in the car and go get a pass, bus pass for the brother. Were you, were you, were you ignorant at this point or were you just, uh, you just didn't care? Uh, what do you mean, ignorant? I mean, <laughs> 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 he means like, I mean, not no, you. I mean, in a way. No, no, uh, no, no, no. I, know, I know what you mean. Of course. Because, <laughs> well, sometimes you have to act like you are. Uh-huh. I mean, sometimes you have to act like you are. I know some people sometimes are just so passionate. It's just like, oh, you know, it's no, just, I mean, uh, we'll sometimes, go do this. I mean, that's a good question. Sometimes you just have to be uh, kind of like, yeah, you have to, I think, ignore in a sense, you just have to ignore Reality. the realities mm. because if not, you're not going to be able to do the work. You won't get anything done. Nothing done. So I remember one time uh, in the city, Chicago, it was me, my wife, my, my daughter was driving in the car. They stopped. The guy was stabbed in his chest with an iron rod. I'm oh talking my. about city of Chicago. The guy came and he fell in front of us. Oh no! And it's seconds later, police officer, police car came, and the guy who stabbed him was running after him. And this is not made up stories, believe me. Wow! Right? I mean, high school kids being shot in their cars. So this is something inner city goes through every single day. Every single day, this is something. Wow. You know, summertime comes in. It's like uh, it's a bloodbath. Uh, it's a bloodbath. So. This work built us to be able to work in these war zones. If and everything not, happens for a reason. Till yeah. today, there mm-hmm. are so many people who have never seen the inner city of Chicago. Mm-hmm. How many Muslims you know? How yeah, many know. non-Muslims you know? For, How to, many everyone's people? too afraid to go there. No one goes there. They don't even, even though there's Muslims there, they neglected uh, them. You know, there's a, there's a brother. His name is Brother uh, Siraj. Uh, brother is amazing brother Muhammad Siraj. Uh, he's mm-hmm. now working with uh, Syrian orphans also. Syrian orphans. Uh, another also brother, I recommend. I really do right? recommend him on this show sometime. Yeah, we are going to have uh, him on the podcast. <coughs> yeah. This brother, I mean, we. I remember in the beginning it was to be him, me, and maybe a few other brothers that used to actually take some food during iftar, one tray. Uh, we would go to Masjid Daaba, for instance, at that time, uh, and we would go. And this is the west side of Chicago, and we would go and have iftar with the brothers there. No one knew how many masajid existed in that area. No one knew what Masjid Daaba, who's Masjid Daaba, Masjid Hassan, Farouk. None of these people. Masjid uh, Farouk at that time used to be on seventy first. No one knew. No one. When we started meeting with these imams, we started working with uh, the shiuch there. People there started taking stuff there, and now it got to a point. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, After so many years, where you have you know, 14, 15, 18 trays every day going in in month of Ramadan. So I'm almost a thousand people eating yeah. every single day of Ramadan. But it took work. It took work. You have to tell yourself, man, we don't do it. Who's going to do it? Not just that. Again, the same thing issue came in. They are your Muslim brothers. These are masajid. You're not talking about, and we, uh, we 
they are Muslims, we are responsible for them. And then, you know, we started doing the work and subhanAllah, Allah opened up ways. Allah opened up ways. How do you keep yourself from uh, spreading too thin? I mean, how big is your organization right now? I know this is uh, Not back t- in the day, right? <laughs> What was that? I know this is back in the day. Uh, I mean, you were doing Chicago. Do you still do do work? Here I mean, ninety ninety nine percent, but well, ninety five. Actually, maybe even ninety nine percent of the of work is volunteer based. Uh-huh. It's amazing. Uh-huh. It's done by volunteers. I mean, now recently in the last two or three months is when we started thinking that we have to put together uh, where we need to really pay people because, uh, in a sense, that we might we need tutors to come in on a daily basis to come and teach we need people who understand uh, certain organizational you know matters in order to be able to organize things better so for our listeners who don't know you actually have a refugee center yeah. type uh, describe what that center is so the center is based on uh, it's it's the, the the location is 6243 northwestern avenue it's about 40 minutes from where we are now uh, in the city of chicago right by the one and uh, of course, we opened that up uh, for a reason. Uh, for the listen- listeners, that the Diwan area is one of the most densely populated uh, area in the country, in the whole of U.S. It is the most densely populated, and it's the most diverse. At one point, you would only see, for instance, you know, Indo Pak, and but now you'll see that you you see Iraq is there and Syrians there and Somalia South Sudan is there. is there and Somalia is there and everyone is coming there, and I have a feeling this is going to become a a a, a ghetto, literally a, a, you know low income uh, people who are just trying to make it go you know that's where they're coming, and of course I think even the government when the refugees are coming in they're bringing them there because. Uh, this is where you can survive there. I mean, transportation is easier. Mm. People don't have, you don't mm. have to have cars to to travel back and forth, wherever you're going, if you find work, things like that. So we established a center there. And uh, there was a lot of missionary work going on there also. You mean in the area? In the yeah. area. Uh, now you have six missionary, Christian missionary centers were set up and set up and are growing. Uh, and the reason for that was, again, you have desperate people coming in for all kinds of needs. They have, they're coming from war zones. They're coming from violent situations. You'll talk to refugees where they have seen their fathers, their throats were cut in front of them. Uh, you'll you'll you talk to some kids who have seen things uh, that no kid I, should see, no child should see, no child should see. Yeah. And then so you're dealing with you know missionary centers were taking these kids, churches were taking these kids, um, and literally, I mean. The trying whole to make point them was Christian. Christian. Yeah. This is exactly, exactly what the point was to to make them Christian, and literally, I mean, they 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 were doing it in the name of giving them resources, in the name of um, so you know, and very playing a lot of very deceptive games with the families. You know, you have families when they come in here, they can barely speak the language, they don't know the culture, they don't mm. know what they can say yes to and what they can say no to. They don't know anything. So any help they'll get, they'll grab it they'll because grab they don't want to. They don't even know how to navigate around there. They don't know the country. Yeah, they course. don't know anything. They Naturally. don't know who's their friend, Very who's vulnerable. their foe. They, no one knows. I mean, it just looks survival right now. They're survive, 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 survive. Some somehow we've, we've got to survive. I don't know. Whatever it takes, we got to survive. So d- describe what happens when. They first come to this country. Where are they coming in from? Are they coming to New York, Chicago? How are they coming in? Over boat, plane? Ellis oh, Island. Obviously. What was that? Ellis Island, right? That's no. where everyone comes in. <laughs> <laughs> so you have... Uh, uh, <clears throat> most of the refugees, first when they are picked up, they are picked up on borders. right? So you have uh, a lot of agencies working in these areas in, in Lebanon and uh, in, in in Jordan, in Gaza, and Turkey, and all these different places. So, UN has the, gets the hold of them, and then they then give to the to the agencies that they bring them here. How do they come here? I mean, they're distributed throughout the country. Okay. No, I mean, is Some there a can? way to to track them uh, so that Muslims can be? Yes, there of course, of, of course. We we learned a very hard hard lesson. Um, hmm. You know, the thing is, we in I think the Muslims in the U.S., I, I still think Muslims throughout the world, many parts of the world, the Muslims are still sleeping, right? Um, you talk to a youth coming in from India, for instance, or, you know, Pakistan, they have no idea of what's, you know, it's it's like they have been kept in a way where 
In a bubble. In a bubble or what's happening in their own country is enough to what they need to worry about than anywhere anywhere else. Yeah. I mean, you have Karachi, for instance. You talk to kids coming from Karachi. They'll say, man, there's suicide bombings going on there every day. Buses are being bombed every day. Karachi was like a war zone without being declared a war. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah, they, they called yeah. the Karachi Wild West. This is yeah. what Karachi Murder is. Murder capital of the world, I think, in 96 right. or something. Right. Yeah. I mean, no, just two years ago even. This yeah. is... It was... Uh, so... People, uh, now, those who are aware are very well aware. Uh, there are movements there. There are people who are trying to make change. But, so, here in this country, we live in a bigger bubble than the rest of the world. And that's because of the comforts right. that we have been given. Now, you know, it's the, the weird thing about this is in this country, you have, there is awareness, but then people are numb to even what they know. <laughs> Because they're, they're they're tired of feeling guilty, a lot a lot of people at this least. What they do is maybe I'll just bury my head in the sand and hope all the stuff goes away. away. Right. You know, it's it's. The, I mean, I remember I gave a khutbah one time in one of the masajid here. I mean, I, you know, and I said, "Look, how many times you've come to divan? Come to divan? How many times you've been to divan? Just an average. Um, I had to f- come there twice, two three times a year." I'm at Hyderabad House every day. <laughs> <laughs> I go. I go about once a people, month. People, I mean, this area, for instance. Okay, they, they people come here often. They come. They grab their pan, their tea, their biryani, whatever it is that they want to get <laughs> yep. their samosa, and, and then they have their you know their moment. I'm back home, and then they go home. Yeah, yeah. Reality hits in, hits the moment you hit. Uh, See the uh, pan stains on the ground. Oh, I'm no longer home. <laughs> now the thing is, on that same street, you have so many people who are in need. Yeah, so many people from students who are coming to study here, from the refugees who are being bad every single day. I mean, the question you have to ask is that okay, we like you said, okay, oh, I'm tired of feeling guilty, but you have six missionary centers. Who should feel more guilty? I mean, you ask yourself that question, right? I mean, you okay, so how come the missionary centers are there? They're working so hard. They are prepared. They're doing everything possible to do what they can because they have a mission. Well, where are the Muslim youth? Where are the Muslim organizations? Where are the Muslims? Where are the mas- There's so many masajids on the street. Every other block there's a masjid. Yeah. And then you have missionaries, uh, you have refugees who are in need. No one goes and asks what's going on, what are their situations, you know. So that took... We had to get on, get to the masajid, we had to give khutbahs, we had to make people aware that, fine, maybe you don't think you can do something back home or whatever, but you can do something right here. Raising awareness. Yeah. Raising awareness was number one thing. Raise awareness to let, look what you are, what, what you're capable of doing. And alhamdulillah, I mean, look, one thing that I'm proud of saying about Islamic Voices, it is one, I think, purely Muslim-run organization without a penny from the government. No one gives us money other than the Muslims. It comes, it's run by the Muslims. Every single thing supported by purely Muslims, like you and I. Hmm. So well, what can people, young, well, whether they're young, old, or whoever, around the country who are listening to this podcast, maybe they don't have an Islamic oasis in their area, but what can they do to help the Syrian refugees? and Well, the refugees uh, in general. I mean, yeah. this, you, that's another thing here. Refugees are not just from Syria. Please keep that in mind. Ah, good point. And this is part part of the awareness here. Refugees are coming from Burma. Refugees are coming. I mean, as I said, remember I I said uh, for Somalia it was Kenya, for Syria it's Turkey, for uh, Burma it's Malaysia also. Oh, right. That country was playing the host country, for instance. So you have the hub over there. A lot of the refugees go from from that area to Malaysia. They come here now. Number one, what can what can the youth do? What can the Muslims do? What can the average person do? There's a lot that we can do. The skills that we have in this country, the youth, the skills that the youth have in this country, the resources available to us, these resources are available nowhere. We don't have the excuse to say that what can we do because what's available to us. You should say, the question that should be asked, we have so many resources, how do we make them, how do you utilize these resources? And I think, if we ask that question, you will be able to do more, rather than saying, you know, asking constantly asking the question, "What can we do?" I see. Right. 
well, we have so many resources. Okay, let's put them together and say, okay, we know what the problems are now. I'm talking to you about refugees. Someone else is going to come and talk to you about illiteracy. Whatever issues are. For, for, for this purposes here, for what I'm talking about, uh, as far as refugees are concerned, we need tutors, for instance. Right? There are many students who are amazing. They're, they're good teachers. They're what, they can come and they can tutor at the center. We have f- food distribution for Saturday of every single month. People can volunteer to bring in food to, you know, donate towards bringing in food and, and, and helping to make sure that the refugees, when they're coming in, or those families who live around there, or poor families, they have food to eat, they have food to put on their table. You know, we do blanket distribution, clothing distribution, whatever it is. You can take, you know, a project and say, I want to focus on the education of the refugees. I want to make sure that the kids that are coming here, they're not lost in the society. I want to make sure they can stand up on their feet. You can't have them just always on, you know, begging or with the hand off. No, we can educate them. So that's, there. you know, everyone has a skill that they can offer. So what you're saying is the, the center that you have for the help of the refugees, there's many different sectors in that center. There's one for education. So if somebody's a teacher, they can actually come and help. Yes. If somebody wants to help with clothing and distribution, they can do that. They can do that. If somebody wants to help with food, they can bring food. And yes. So there's many fruits to pick from. Yes. In in this organization of yours, I think that's amazing. You can help people. You know, there. Are, you know, today we had this more. Actually, before we came here, we had a meeting with few people in the area who are experts in uh, IT, for instance. And they said, you know what, we can provide this help to you and say maybe we can take few refugees that you have and let's build them to, so they can find a job. Uh, amazing things like that. So there's a lot that we can do with that. You know, so not only help their kids, help the families themselves stand up on their feet. It's a nece- it's a necessity. Of course, I think each and uh, every individual needs to take a hard look at what what skills they have and what skills they can offer to the world or their local community you know yeah what's that saying uh work locally think globally or so basically if you, if you focus on working locally your mindset is going to lead to you working globally or it's going to help globally definitely of course right? i mean think about it just say facebook for instance right i mean when you put look this is what's happening Within moments, you have probably, you know, 50 individuals in every part, in different part of, parts of the world who just saw that message and you can get that message across of what's mm. happening. I mean, we have all types of tools and resources available, right? I mean, there's, we have no excuse. I and mean, all of us are on constantly on our phones. We are on our, our social media. We have all kinds of resources which need, we can utilize. So it doesn't have to be that you have to go to a war zone. It doesn't have to be. A lot of these revolutions get started involved, with Twitter. Get involved, and you'll see, you yourself will be able to see what you can do. You will come up with ideas yourself and say, we need to do this. And you will come and you'll say, hey, I think this is focused. This is something you guys haven't been doing. I think I can do that. Mm. And if you're an absolute knucklehead like me, you can at least load a truck. <laughs> load a truck and, and, and put some uh, uh, rice bags in a truck and help send that in a container overseas i know a lot of muslims around the country are doing that so there really isn't there there is no excuse but people like to make excuses oh like i i still hear from muslims oh you know those syrians this is muslims talking forget about non-muslims they're fighting among each other who's right who's wrong you know these type of conversations are happening when they really just don't want to admit that they don't really care. I mean, yeah. and, that, and that's how we've dropped. I mean, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that. Look how we've dropped. We, in order to help, we have to find out who's right and wrong first. Right. Not about just helping humanity. And this is not just about helping Muslims only. It's about anyone who's under any type of oppression, anyone who's in need. You know, even your neighbor. If your neighbor is hungry, it, the Quran doesn't, uh, uh, you know, have set a condition on us to help our neighbor if he's Muslim or not Muslim. If he's whatever his situation is right. if we have to help him right or her I, so yeah i think the opposite is true too i mean um you I, I know especially at school i mean a lot of people they get passionate about something you know it's like hey let's sponsor a few refugee guys but then the thing is like uh everyone feels like that's enough um you know it's like hey let's let's get together sponsor cuz uh someone did that at our school they got together maybe 20 30 people and then you know we are, we sponsored i don't know a few uh, Syrian refugees, and they feel that's enough. I mean, 
I don't know. I feel like we we have this mentality where money is the solution for everything, or that's that's what everyone needs from us, right? Mm. I didn't know that's you guys have, have tutoring classes. I didn't I didn't know you guys uh, have have volunteering for these things. So if I were to come, what uh, what would I what would I do? I mean, and how I mean, the setup I be? I mean, like, how would just you told me you're you're a mathematician, right? Yeah, I'm not I mean, think about this. You have <laughs> most people, whether they're a refugee or they're not. Everybody hates math. <laughs> <laughs> you just everyone hates math. Yeah. <laughs> Imagine what you can do. You can come in, help somebody, uh, someone literally build their lives. If not, most kids here drop out of school. Right after certain years in college or associates, they drop out. For many, math is the biggest problem. Mm -hmm. They just don't because they can't do it, and they will just drop school because of that. Right. Just you, I'm talking as an individual, you as an individual, right? If you come in and you say, hey, look, I can do this and you help these kids, imagine what you're doing for their future. What they have done, what you have done for them. And imagine what their right? du'as are like. What their One child like. is, yeah. But before that, you know, you mentioned something, you said, oh, people come together and they, they do something and then they leave. That's very true. And the reason I say that's, that's true and that happens a lot is because the Muslims who are working in organizations, they are missing the ideological background. Why we do what we do. We'll describe that. What is the ideological background? Because a lot of Muslims don't understand. Ideological that. background meaning there are things that we have to do as Muslims because our aqidah, our belief, belief, fundamentals of Islam as a Muslim ask us to do. It asks, this is from our creed. Creed. That's the right word. This is our creed telling us what to do. You don't have a choice to, like you were saying, like I said earlier, we don't have a, a that's not a luxury that we have. Mm -hmm. This is why you'll see a lot of people, they might give up or they'll do one or two events and it's all gone. Or you'll see a lot of youth, they go to MS, MSAs and after MSAs, you know, their life is after school, universities are done, nothing. You just see them it's all gone you know they go back to just have children they have wives uh, cars and that's it life is over mm -hmm. that's because of that ideological background is missing if you build yourself according to the way Allah you know if, according to the the aqidah of Islam there is no way we will do that and that motivation comes from that aqidah Constantly that we must change. We need to help. We need to support. We have to do this. We have to do that. We have to, even to the point I have a problem. People saying Syrian refugees, Burmese refugees, uh, Iraqi refugees, South Sudan, Afghan. We don't have that concept, right? Yeah. I mean, it, that itself is okay. So why will somebody from let's say Burma be motivated to help a person from Syria? Why will somebody from Afghanistan be motivated to help? People in Syria now, you'll see a lot of youth, they're motivated because they see, oh, Syria, what's happening, what's happening. I'm not from Syria. Actually, none of us here, none of us are from Syria here. Yeah. Right. Neither are we from Burma. But why do we care about Syria? Goes back to the creed. We have to help. Allah Azza is going to ask. Allah Azza is going to ask. These are the things that are going to make us succeed. These are the things that, are, and also there is a solution. Now, one more time to be critical here. A lot of the organizations, sometimes I feel, especially the you know so-called relief organizations and humanitarian organizations, they they almost live on disasters. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, look, we are. I'm I'm saying even yes, we we do this, but and I observe that in Somalia. Hmm. You were talking to me about or, you know earlier about this. A lot of the organizations almost wait for a next disaster because that's. That's right there. Oh, now we can go and fundraise. Right. Now people are emotional for that. Three weeks, four weeks, five weeks, people are all crazy. There's an earthquake. There is a, there's a war has started. There's a massacre. There's this, there's that. Okay, okay, let's use that. Utilize it. All of a sudden, the marketing comes out. All of a sudden, their things come out. Oh, okay. You know, but if you actually listen to what they have to say, a lot of the heads of these organizations, what they have to say, they'll talk to you like a CEO, CEO is talking to you. They will not talk to you from why is this happening? What, what are the reasons for these massacres? Why do these keep ha why do they uh, keep happening? You know, what are the reasons for, for, for these disasters? Why is the Muslim world in chaos the way it is? Why shouldn't we, why don't we talk about actual change, bringing in real change that will stop this type of, you know, ca you know, constant disasters that are taking place? But, 
when you come in from the this uh, this understanding that okay we are an organization we are waiting for a disaster and boom let's let's go in there and that's what's happening for so we, many we become complete reactionaries reactionaries I mean, just, and it's money making business i'm telling you yeah well, for certain organizations it's definitely for certain organizations yeah. this is definitely money making orga- yeah. you know money making thing oh okay let's let's use this now people are emotional make the money and okay after that why don't ask why don't ask I mean, that was one of I came and I asked many questions here when I came back from Somalia. I went to many organizations and I, I put that questions to them. But they said, oh, uh, we don't get involved politically. Well, I said, I'm not asking you to get involved politically, meaning that, you know, in, in I'm asking you a question. We work in these fields. We work in these disaster zones, war zones. We have to ask, for instance, in uh, Mogadishu, the country is surrounded by water. If you look at... <laughs> <laughs> you look at the country, you look at where Mogadishu is. Yeah, it's the, the Horn Indian of Africa, Ocean, right? Yep. Horn of Africa, Indian Ocean, right there. Huge, huge ocean. And you ask a question, well, people are dying of famine. Hmm. How does that happen? Hmm. When, a, when, a, when a city or a country is surrounded by water and then the people are dying of not having enough food. Wow. Why don't, you, why don't the organizations ask those questions? You know, oh, okay, uh, go get fish. It's the most healthiest food you can eat. Go build the teach the people how. Well, you know, there there are some organizations actually did not work with me because I was asking those political questions. I said, but this is this seems this disaster it's the is the root by, of the problem. This is disaster by design. Yeah. yeah. This disaster is by design. This is not because somebody just it's, it's a natural. It, I mean, it, I'm sorry to cut you off. It must be very disheartening for you as somebody who works on the ground and you know what the root problem is and you know how it can be solved, but you have to keep on doing it because you see your surrounding, right? You see what's happening. And I mean, what what like, what like goes through your mind when that happens? You know what the root of the problem is, but you can't ask certain questions. Somebody said you're not going to be alive if you keep asking these questions. Well, they, right? no, the organizations will say, um, uh, no, uh, we, we, they'll just not start, they'll stop working with you. Yeah, but for you yourself, like how Why? Now? Because you're asking pinpointed questions. You're asking questions that matter. Yes. And this is what the, what my problem is with a lot of humanitarian relief organizations. They know what the issues are. Yes. But because to the point that, you know, like for instance, I give a lot of khutbas around. Mm-hmm. And I when I came back and I talked about what was happening in Mogadishu, a lot of the people, they will, will be, they'll be willing to donate to you. But then because you're asking well, fine, we can go and we can build a few things over there. Like we were working on building a tent city, for instance, for 10,000 people. Okay, we can do all of that. The problem here is you have people who are internally displaced, which means they have, I mean, they're being moved from this area to this area, 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 or back to where they were, and then from there to that. It's, it's, okay, so why is that happening? Yeah. Okay, so why are the governments, there's a formation of a government takes place, and after three weeks, somebody elsewhere does not like that form of government, that formation, or who's in that government. And then a few weeks later, that place is removed, or those people are removed. And because of this continuation of this kind of process, people are completely displaced because there is no stability. Hmm. And I mean, the reason why I think you ask these questions, your background, I mean, even your education, you right. majored in political science and what you did something in economy or something. It, yeah, I did my master's in political science. Master's in and, political uh, science. Disaster yeah. management. This is one of the And things. disaster. Okay. Wow. Yeah. That, that clarifies a lot of things and how your tactics are and the questions that you ask. But my question, if we can just revisit it and you could probably answer in a minute because I don't want to take too much time on this, is that you know that if you know what the dilemma is, you know what the problems are with a lot of these places. And you're asking those questions and no one wants to answer those questions. And they want to continue if you want to say, and I don't want to undermine any work that anyone's doing, but they're doing a lot of patchwork because if they ask the root question, they're going to get in trouble, right? So how does someone continue going? Because for a lot of people, that could be disheartening. They can be like, I know what the root problem is and I can't get to it. I'm not even going to do it, you know? Well, that's what I said. Look, that's what I was saying earlier. I said, we, the Muslims... uh, the ideological background is missing. Yes. Right? Uh, majority of the people, thinkers, people who are thinking about what's happening are getting in trouble because they are thinking. Hmm. Right? I mean, look at uh, the scholars in Saudi Arabia, for instance. Majority of the jails are filled with thinkers. These are thinking people, scholars. 
Majority of the jails in the Muslim world are not full of uh, criminals. Uh, they're not criminals, right? Robbers. They're, they're robbers, or they're not. These are <laughs> these are scholars, are PhDs. These are uh, people who ask. They, they they should be teachers. They should be their. Do- I'll give you an example. Even Syria itself. They ask thought-provoking questions. They're asking the right questions. Yeah. They're saying, "Fine, these are things that are happening, but why?" Hmm. And that's where the trouble starts. Why? Don't ask why. Why? Don't ask why. Yeah. Just work. You know, it, it, this is... Maintain, some, the, maintain the status maintain, quo. Maintain the status quo. And that is... So somebody is making sure, don't rock the boat. Hmm. Don't ask the questions that are going to say, oh, okay, there, there's going... There. Don't ask that why question because that is where the solution lies. Even though it's natural to ask that. Little kids will always ask you why about everything, Right. Right. But what have we been trained to do? Exactly. Don't worry about that. That's not yeah, your problem. None of your business. None of your business. Um, Mohammed, uh, you know, from asking the question to finding a solution, I mean, what makes your organization different? I mean, um, I mean, do you, do you go? Do you teach? Do you teach them how to fish? I mean, I, I don't mean it as a as a joke or whatever. But what do you do? That's a, no. It's a yeah, valid that's question. That's a good question. Uh, that question. is exactly. So, what are the one of the things that we are doing? Number one. Uh, <sighs> Look, we, we, we are providing relief, for instance, blankets and food. and whatever. But our focus is not that. The focus is the education. Education is where the point where you just, what you mentioned, is that, you know, teaching the people how to fish. If we don't educate the youth, their kids, the adults, we are not going to get them. We need the, the, the families to be on their feet. They have to get on their feet. If not, you you know, people are emotional about it today. They're not going to be emotional tomorrow. They're going to say, well, you know, we got to find other ways. So tutoring, that's why tutoring came in. Uh, ESL programs came in. Uh, one of the things we are working now on, uh, actually we're going to start working on, is also simple, even getting people to know where the flea markets are, for instance. Yesterday we, we sent some of the, fa- you know, <laughs> like, here, go and here are the addresses for flea markets. Go here, go check it out, find out. Then they came back and they said, you know what? I've been a businessman 10 years of my life. That's what I used to do in, in Damascus or Damascus. Okay, take them to wholesalers and show them where they can buy th- things cheap and go and, and sell in these markets. So that's another thing that we are working on. Awesome. To, to get people to, uh, you know, and, and many of them are actually buying things wholesale and selling them on the streets on Divan, for instance. Hmm. That's another thing. So we are we are willing to buy the the first time buy the product for them and then now they it's their it's their work there's hard work to to double it for them so uh the other things are also you know as we said we're working with other uh you know professionals to see to bring their skills to the table uh, it uh, professionals things like that in order to get them where they can build their resume and actually get a job uh, you know so these are uh, all of these things are to to help them fish even uh, we are teaching them. I'll give you an example. For instance, uh, you have kids that come in; they have never have not seen school in the last five years. Okay, the revolution started. The uh, kid was he was seven years old. Now he's twelve. Hmm. He was from homes. Uh, this is one example. So he was taken from there and they put him in in a refugee camp in uh, in Jordan. Was it Jordan or Turkey? I think. Well. And then he said, I, he doesn't, only thing he knows is how to speak the language. He doesn't know how to write it. He doesn't know how to read it. Arabic you're talking uh, about. I'm talking about Arabic. Yeah. Yeah. Arabic. When he came, so we, we took students like that. There, there are many of them. And we saw the same thing from South Sudan, for instance. They only know how to speak Arabic. They didn't know how to read or write Arabic. So when we started with even simple, the Asan Quran, for instance, or uh, Nurani Qaeda, these books, three months, now they can actually read the language that they speak. Wow. wow. I mean, it's a big deal. I mean, yeah. I never realized that, right? Until I actually saw, they're so happy. Oh my God, I can actually read the Quran. Oh. I can actually read Arabic now, man. I can, this is the language I speak. Yeah. But nobody taught me how to read. Wow. <laughs> so you have, but you have to have the kids, you have to have at least one language down. And from there, you can teach them other languages. Of course. All right. But I take pride in that. You know, I take pride in saying, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, that Allah will give us. We didn't, I didn't think about that. But when the kids come and say, hey, I can read Quran now. I can actually read this. You know, I didn't know anything about it. You know, imagine you don't know uh, the, the, the letters, but you speak the language. Now they can pick up a newspaper and actually read, you know, and for the ones who speak Arabic. So now this is for any language. 
But we were focusing on because they wanted to learn how to read Quran. But subhanAllah, now not only can they read the Quran, they can read a book in Arabic. Same thing with English. So many kids came, used to come in in the beginning. I'm just telling you the three months since we opened up the center. In three months, so many kids would come in. They did not know how to spell and. And now they're, they're reading a page. They can read a page without a problem. They can read two pages. And I give that to so many of the tutors, uh, you know, who are coming and they work so hard with these kids. So how does that work? You have tutors coming in. I'm just going to digress for a little bit. And they just come to you and they say, uh, you know, I do this, I do this, I can help with this. So they start right away or they, how many hours right. a day do they come? Are no they time. 9 to 5? How yeah, is yeah. it? The program, uh, so the tutoring specific, the tutoring program is 4 to 7. 4 to 7, the kids come in because they go to school. They finish 3.30. They go home, they eat, and then they get to our place. By the time they get to the center, it's four, between 4 or 4.30. And then we pray Maghrib, we start. There's a dars, 10 minutes dars, because we had to start even teaching them how to pray, all of those things. Yes. You think. And then, boom, two hours of just pure <laughs> math. And science. I remember when I, when, I, when I was there, you were you letting can, me know yes. that none of them can leave until they read Quran. Yes, they have right? to do that. They have to read Quran. And some of them are hafal and they have to memorize. Right. So you balance and some it. of them just memorize from listening. They don't know oh, how to read. Really? Yes. That's a very common thing, by the way. So many of them have memorized from hearing. But they can't read. That's amazing. Wow. wow. Yeah. But th- I think that's awesome. That's a nice balance between the yeah. dean and, and, and just their academic work is they no one can leave unless they read a little bit of Quran, right? Yes. I mean, they have to read the Quran, <coughs> uh, at least a page. They have to, we had to make sure. And actually, uh, what happened was uh, one of the, I mean, so now you have the missionaries come in here and they're like, well, all of a sudden we took 95% of their kids. Oh, wait, how did that happen? What do you mean? Uh, I mean, you know, now you have... All these centers are full of kids from Burma and Iraq and Syria and all over, right? So all of a sudden, and, and you know, we open up the center. We realize what the need is. We open yeah. up the center. And all of a sudden, we went to these centers. And man, I remember <laughs> going by these the doors. I'll stand by the doors and be like, why are you here? For the missionary centers? Uh, yeah, yeah. I'll wow. stand by the doors. And, and <laughs> oh why are you God. here? <laughs> yeah, yeah, man. <laughs> why are you here? And, and subhanAllah, so at one point, I, we had the center. We, we, the, when we opened up the first time, we opened yeah. up the, 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 the office was right above the missionary center. Allah. Yeah. Wow. Think about and, and look at the names. Islamic Oasis, Divan Oasis. <laughs> oh, they were Divan called Oasis? Divan Oasis? Yeah. Divan Oasis is the name of the missionary center, and Islamic Oasis is us, and we've been there longer than them. Oh, they did it on purpose. Oh, I remember. Yes, yes, yes. So they they do these things, right? I don't know if they did it on purpose or or, or not. We'll see. You're not going to say, but we're going to say. I I don't know. I don't know. I'm not going to say anything. Or whatever. You don't say. We'll say. Leave that up to us. You know, maybe I don't know. (laughs) Now. And even to the point, even some of the, uh, you know, the, the, the artwork that we have in our logo is almost the same. I don't, mm-hmm. I mean, it's just kind of like. Like I said, you're not going to say they did it on purpose. So then, uh, but I don't know. When we opened up the office, I don't think they realized we've been around eight years. I think I heard that they were around two years. Mm. So there's a organization called World Relief that is a Christian missionary organization that brings in these, uh, you know, brings in the refugees and stuff like that. So they were going after the kids. Kids would walk after school. Uh, you know, they're going and they would stop, give them soap, give them water bottles, give them, you know, kids are going, a lot of kids are just walking right in front mm. of the center. So give them, give them, give them, give, oh, you need help with math. Are you okay with this? Are you okay? With this? Come, 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 come. So they did that for a long time. So we realized and we opened up the center. The moment we opened up the center, and we started letting the people know that there's an Islamic uh, organization that is doing this and we have Muslims who are teaching and you don't have to go to these places. 95% switch right away. They started coming to center. Now wow. we have 60, 70 kids coming in. And then, uh, so these missions, they started calling the homes of the refugees. Oh. Yeah. They started calling their homes and started telling them, Oh, why are you going there? You know, we're not saying that we want to change the the religion of your kids and stuff like that. I know over there that man he's saying over there, all, <laughs> so he's saying all of that, but that's not what we say, you know. So he said uh, some of the parents they're telling me this story. They're like, oh, we told them uh, it's okay, it's okay, but okay, but, you know, we, there are things that he does you can't do. So he said, no, 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 we can do everything. We'll provide you with everything. So he said, okay, teach us Quran. <laughs> 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 well we can't teach you well we can't do that so well he teaches Quran and our kids need it so we have to take them there <laughs> that was one of the <laughs> what an so, incentive it's amazing and amazing. subhanallah so n- that's one of the reasons a lot of kids come in and they're very bright kids mashallah they don't come you in. guys have a, a, a game room also 
for yeah, yeah. so fridays we have uh well what we did was uh fridays we started a project a project day we call it sometimes a movie day sometimes a project day so we have families subhanallah muslims from around they come in and they sponsor we had a family the other day they came in they sponsor food or dinner for 100 kids for instance and what we are doing now is we'll have a refugee family cook it we will give them the money instead of ordering pizza for instance mm. so they will take the money they will cook it they'll bring food for about two hundred ten dollars, you can feed easily hundred kids twice. Wow! Wow! That's you know, I mean, subhanallah. This is uh, imagine two hundred people or hundred p- kids. There's no way you can feed uh, even just p- simple pizza will cost you most more than three hundred four hundred dollars. Anyway, so they come in and we do projects, different projects. Uh, so kids will come in and we have some. Sometimes they'll work with wood. Sometimes they'll work with lo- Legos. Sometimes they'll work with just putting together posters. Sometimes they'll work. You know, they'll put together, uh, like the other day, they all had to memorize a dua and they get a gift if they memorize the dua. Very nice. Or they watch movies. We have different movies on Salah al-Din, for instance. On, we had the Hadith <laughs> movie the other day, which is the man, the, 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 the boy and the king, um, the messenger, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the, the movie on that. We, so we showed, you know, to make it entertaining. And then we had a few days where we did uh, ice hockey type. What do you call those things? We set up different air hockey games, uh, air hockey games yeah. stuff like this. All people come in and then they... But now we're already planning for uh, for summer. And now we're planning for Ramadan. Um, I don't think we'll close at all in the month of Ramadan. I don't even know how that's going to happen. I'm right, just I'm wow. thinking about it and I'm like, yeah, I don't know what's going to happen. It, the kids are off. It's summer. Uh, that place is going to become, uh, I don't know what right now. So I don't even have the words for it. <laughs> Does every masjid in uh, the Chicagoland area know about Islamic Oasis? Do they know that if uh, families come to them for you know help, they know to refer them to you? Yeah, because so, you guys have a certified counselor also, right? Yeah. yeah. So And uh, most of, alhamdulillah, and a lot of our teachers... And as I said, I myself, I have a master's in political science and disaster management. My wife also, uh, her name is Isra Abdul Ghani. She does the same thing where she has master's in social work. Um, so she does a lot of advocacy work also because we have issues where families come in, they go to the hospitals and hospitals, uh, they just want to save money. So they'll be like, oh, you don't have this paper. You don't have this. You don't have that. Yeah. You have people who need surgeries, right? For instance. So they would call us and we would adv- advocate for them that look, mm. let's talk to your social work department. We want to talk to your social worker on, the, on, on, on staff and we would do that. So Amazing. we have that. So we have people who understand what needs to be done. The masajid, do they know about it? Yes, they do. They are getting to know more and more masajid are getting involved. Alhamdulillah, Rabbi, there's no question about it. And uh, because also because of uh, the khutbas, I, uh, anywhere that I'm going now, I am bringing this thing, this issue that we have to support, we have to work. Uh, we have a responsibility to the, our brothers and sisters who are coming here. How does the refugee family know where to go when they first come here? Because a lot of them, they can't even speak the language, right? They They can't even speak English. So... Uh, well, what, did, does the government allow any aid organizations or, or charity organizations like yourself to to interact with them before, even, yeah. you know, as, as they're entering the country? Hey, you know, um, if you're with this ethnicity or maybe if you're with this religion, maybe you might want to talk to so-and-so. Or does the government just say, here you go, we have something set up for you over here, and then you figure it out? No, there are organizations like you have Refugee One, Refugee Two, as World well, Relief Organization. There are organizations that are that 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 they are working with the refugees. They're on the list of the government, so they get called or they take the refugees. Like so that. the government calls for them. us so far. For us, it's been uh, word of mouth, where the refugees find out about us from word of mouth that hey, there's an organization like this. They do this, they get help. So now the massages are referring the families that are coming to them. Like MCC the other day referred to us. Uh, they said, we have 20 families that just come in. We're going to send them to you. Wow. We need you to take care of, you know, because we make sure right away the essentials are taken care of. Blankets, warm clothes, food, uh, whatever that we can do right away that they can go home with something. Because it's cold. People, are, The thing is, it's people were not used to, they, don't, they didn't understand how cold it gets. Mm. Okay. Imagine you're talking about September, October. Yeah, September. It was like summer for us. <laughs> it was. 
So people were coming in and they're like, man, it's so cold, it's so cold, it's so cold. And we're giving them blankets or they would, you know, they're still not real. They won't realize why we're giving, why we're giving them these thick blankets that we give them. And we tell them this jacket that you have on is not going to be enough, man. You got to put this. You don't know. You don't know. And now <laughs> when they walk out, there's like four <laughs> degrees out there, man. And people yeah. are like, oh my God, dude, how do we deal with this? So a lot of education. Well, now by experience. But uh, to the original question, yes, people are finding out through Masajid, through well, other you guys organizations. Mainly the word of the we're mouth, getting, you know. uh, we're also getting called. Yesterday, we actually got a call from uh, other non-Muslim uh, non-profits who are calling us and saying that, look, we have received this family. They are Muslims. They want to know, you know, they can't speak language. Or so we have on staff. We have people who can speak uh, Arabic and they can speak English and they can speak Burmese and people who we have volunteers who can right away. Uh, deal with if there's only someone who speaks only Burmese we have people who can speak Burmese and hmm. you know we have a uh, what, what kind of percentage are what, what kind of percentage are we looking at uh, at your charity uh, is it 90% Syrian 10% Burmese How, what's going on in terms so of it's at this point we, you can say about 70% are Burmese oh wow yeah 70% 70%, 70% are Burmese wow, wow. Uh, about and then you have mix of Syrians, uh, Iraqis. Iraqis are also a very big uh, amount. About you know uh, another t- ten twenty percent. What language do they speak in Burma? Uh, Burmese. So uh, Rohingya. Do you, do you have someone? So you who... have uh, within Burma also. Then you have Rohingya and then you have Burmese. Right, right. They're Muslims, but they're Rohingya and then they're Burmese also. Rohingya is a specific ethnic. Mm. I People was just in uh, uh, Milwaukee, for instance, last Sunday. Yeah. Uh, I was there. They, we, they they asked us to bring in. There were 250 families from Burma that came in. So they said they are there, 250 families. Established in Milwaukee. There, in Milwaukee. So we took a truck. We filled it up with 250 bags of rice, 200, 210 blankets, 250 bottles of oil, sugar, uh, bread. We filled that, oh. And then we took it there. Almost close to $9,000 worth of uh, product. We took it there. And we, we distribute it to the families. You can actually see that on our, uh, as I said, the Facebook site. Yeah. And Islamic what is your Facebook Oasis, again? Islamic Oasis Save a Life Campaign. So you'll see the pictures and we put the videos and of how people helped us over there. And, and then they came in yesterday. We gave them, we had 10 extra computers that we, we didn't need. We donated it to, to them because they have 175 kids. Wow. Every day they come in to learn Quran, yeah. for instance, and things like this. So they want the center to be put together for their kids where they can come in use the internet things like this so there is so much help that is that's needed i mean the youth are the ones that can drive this um just, just a quick question um you're not one of those guys that sits in the background that has all your volunteers do all the work i'm guessing you probably went to milwaukee drove the truck yourself right uh, yes i went to milwaukee this time i made them work no, <laughs> <laughs> no, no. so Alhamdulillah, we have a good uh, volunteer base, very dedicated brothers and sisters, very dedicated brothers and sisters. I, you know, that's one of the things, actually, one of the volunteers asked me, that was his first or second time, maybe third time, he said, he said, man, how come you guys have this very dedicated uh, base of of volunteers that are just, they're amazing. I mean, they're not, they don't ask for anything. They just, uh, and I think it's because the hearts are, are are at the right place. In a lot of the volunteers, if, I, if I'm not mistaken, they're also refugee families. Many of them are refugee right? families, uh, yes, and also not refugee families. Yeah, of youth, course, uh, Muslim youth from here, amazing, amazing youth. I mean, if the, you know, this is, you know, I think we are working on this. One of these days, we're going to have a youth conference at our center. Beautiful. It's going to be called Youth Conference, where we'll bring the youth from all over, universities, colleges, from whatever background, come. Let's talk to you about what we do, and you guys give us ideas of what can be done. Because that's how innovation happens, right? I mean, you can't think about just, uh, you're not going to be able to. Because sometimes you get, you're so involved, you don't know, you forget what else can be done. How? Because you're, you're in, in there. There's yeah. others who have a bird view, and they're saying, hey, man, look, you guys are doing this, but I think you're doing it wrong. Or you can make it more attractive, you can make it more organized, you can make it more sufficient, or efficient. So, Yes, I mean, I don't think if, if, if the leadership of any organization, if they're not working on the ground and if they're not pushing and, and shoving and they're not doing all the things that are necessary, you will fail. You will fail right away. Because people, you, people want to see 
hey, you're telling people to do all this. What are you doing? Mm, exactly. Right? And this is ayah in the Quran. لِمَا تَقُولُونَ مَا لَا تَفْعَلُونَ and it's Allah says in the Quran, Ya you ladina amalu di mataqulu na mala tafalun. Kabur maqtan inda Allah and taqulu mala tafalun. Why do you say oh you believe? And this is to the believers. Why do you say something you don't do? Allah hates people who say something they don't do. So we are no alhamdulillah. All of our the leadership team, the brothers and sisters who are on the are on the leadership, every single one is working. Every single person is working. And if you walk in there, come one of these days, you will not know who's who. You will not know who is who. Everybody's they know what they're doing and they're doing an amazing job. And you'll see, uh, hey, we'll criticize each other. Uh, we'll argue uh, issues that happen, how to fix something, how to make things happen. But everyone knows there's a bigger goal. And we got to do this. People from Michigan are calling us. Uh, they want us to establish Islamic voices there. In Houston, they're calling us, uh, especially in Austin, because a lot of refugees are coming to that area. Mm-hmm. They're asking us to come and establish Islamic voices there. They, you know, in Michigan, as I said, Michigan, Houston, I think Atlanta, or because especially in uh, Georgia, it's a huge base of uh, refugees there. Yeah, they're asking us. Milwaukee literally is asking us, and they're asking for young scholars. They're saying we don't, we can't speak English. Number one, and we don't have the knowledge. A lot of these kids, we want them to get come to the right direction. We don't have khatibs. They have a school. They don't have khatibs. They don't have people who can come and teach them the deen. Even if it's just once a month. And that's something that we need to talk about. right? Student leaders, youth leaders, people who may not be scholars, or they are scholars, that can say, you know what, I can give one Jum'ah, I can give one Saturday a month to this place in Milwaukee, for instance, to Islamic Oasis, to come and share my knowledge. Right? So there are many things everyone can do, from a scholar to a to a layman. I mean, and in this country, I don't I don't think there are that many. Everyone has a skill here. Yeah, everyone has a skill. Well, well, what what are some challenges that some people, you know, who are trying to form their own Islamic oasis in their city, like Atlanta and Austin and uh, Milwaukee? Oh, what? What can they do? Well, after you've been through all the hurdles and all the problems, what would you tell them to to do first? Well, one of the first things I think is understanding the game, right? I mean, it's 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 very important. I mean, before we started working in the inner city, uh, and we realized okay, what we need to do, we were working in the inner city two years prior to even having this organization. Mm. There was another organization that my wife was part of. Actually, she started it called uh, Hijabis in the Hood. Yeah. <laughs> and if you know, <laughs> this awesome. was all women, yeah. all sisters organization that was actually there that inspired us to put together Islamic Oasis. Wow. When they called it Hijabis in the Hood. <laughs> wow. And uh, they were working with the Masajid. They were working on the streets giving dawah. They were the ones. I mean, we were scared to go in that area and you have sisters in their hijabs doing wow. the dawah work. Wow. So, Impressive. Then finally we decided, okay, well, you know what? There has to be an organization because you need finances to run these things, right? From buying Qurans to everything needs. So we had, so number one issue, you, you, you have to understand, okay, this is the area, whatever it is, project that you're going to choose, you have to know ins and outs of it. If not, you're going to fail. I mean, like the saying goes, don't go in a business you don't know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You're going to fail. And this is exactly. So number one thing, we, we would like to train the people who want to do this type of work. We will train them for, I will say, for free. They don't have to start an Islamic, you know, oasis. Any organization that you want to start, that you want to help benefit humanity, you know, we will teach you the ins and outs, what it takes yeah. from the paperwork to what kind of skills you need to have yourself. Yeah. Right? One of the things for me that worked out a lot was also I was very much involved already in the masajid. Yeah. giving khutbas, things like this. That's a skill I think for Islamic organizations, somebody who's going to start it has to have. You have to be able to speak to the Muslims in the language they understand, if that's what you're going to do, if it's going to be an Islamic organization. You have to be able to talk to them in their language. You have to be able to, if not, you will not be able to motivate people to even help you, to right. work with you. So those are all the things, education in Islam itself. Obviously, it's an Islamic organization. So you have to have knowledge of the deen. But it's very easy to start. Yeah, it's very easy to start, and I, I, I advise, and I'm actually, I would, I would I, I, it's, it's something. Please, if you are thinking about it, go and talk to the people there, brothers, sisters working all over. Talk to them and start, because there's always a need 
there's someone there's something out there that no one is thinking about you know just like when we when we did this thing in the inner city no one was thinking about it even yeah. to the point i'll give you an example when we started this thing to work started in the, originally when we started islamic oasis when we started working in the inner city so many people from the masjid came and told us why why do you want to waste your time there man mm-hmm. hmm. so many people came in they told us oh come on man you know you're really doing there and come on what are you going to be able to achieve people there don't care and this and that and the other and so wow. there are th- th- that's number one. you have to be able to, you have to be very strong and the same thing happens when you did the work in international arena so many people will come and they'll say so many things and number one is your own people will first come and try to say yeah they're not doing so, them anything themselves but want to make sure that no one else is doing anything either <laughs> they're, they're all you know, we have that problem in our community yeah, it seems yeah. like just this podcast where, where uh, we talk to a couple people like no i don't think anyone want to listen to this podcast that you have it's a great idea you have but it's well intentioned no no I, people no, will listen believe me people will listen no, no listen this, so i'm just saying that that there's people who will want to kill any anything that anyone else is doing for uh, for whatever reason I, I'm not going to look inside their their head and say, well, what they... But there's people who want to sabotage mean, you right away. One thing I'll tell you, I think this is the first time in this setting where I was able to actually just sit down and talk about so many experiences in with, with, with so many different projects we've done. Yeah. No one gave us the time. I mean, I was thinking about telling one of the brothers, just, I said, man, I was, I, I was actually speaking to my wife. I said, man... How are we going to eight years of work, yeah, right, in so many different countries, so many different projects? No one knows what we have done, yeah, because at one point, our marketing was not really out there, you know everyone knows so many different organizations, nobody knows us, but you know this who knows how many people will listen to this, yeah, yeah. I wanted to ask no, uh, um I mean kind of uh, what's next for you guys and uh what are some things people can do to volunteer? I mean, um, I'm sure you got you have some there's, roles coming up. There's quite a few things coming up, actually. Uh, one of the things that I would also uh, kind of put out there, as I said, awareness is important. We have a lot of you that are coming from India and Pakistan. Uh, they come here and they are in need. Many of them come in on student visas, things like this. They don't know anything about how things work here in this country. Uh, many of them are poor and they they're trying to make it here they don't have anything in their homes they come to us many times and they ask for blankets and this and that we have to have people who can actually direct them many of them come to divan also many of them so many are trying to figure out that's a project someone can say you know what i am i can start working with these youth that come here and we can direct them uh, they're legal here they have visas they can that's one thing so one of the things we are actually thinking about is how to make sure that these kids, there's a way when they come here, they can come to an organization and find out how things work here. It's important. They need to know. And also, they want to come to Islamic organization. Mm-hmm. You know, they don't want to go here and there. They want to go to someone who's going to care, who understands what they go through. They understand the culture. They understand Islam, Muslims. That's one. So that's one of the things that we're working on. The other thing also is, uh, you know, the future of the refugees. Uh, what what do we need to do? What's going to happen? Because the next few the refugees are not going to stop coming in anytime soon. There are many of them. Many of them are coming in, and that's something we need to think about. Okay, you know that whole idea of lost generation, right? We have a lot of yeah. people already thinking about this that we have lost. Okay, so those kids are coming here. What do we do to make sure that they are not lost in this country? Uh, there's there's a lot. I mean, there's uh, there's a lot of writing that needs to be done. Uh, one of the things is also, uh, you know, simple. I'll give you an example, man. Simple. You know, if you want to teach, like, there's so many Burmese. They want to learn how to drive a car, right? Mm-hmm. They don't know how to speak the language. They drove a car twenty years. Some of them they know how to drive, but they can't give a simple exam here because they don't know the English language. You can have youth come in here who can speak, let's say, Burmese or Urdu or Arabi. They can come and translate this paperwork and teach them how to take this test. And here's a guy that can start driving and you got him on his feet. Yeah. Simple, simple things like this. 
that people don't even think about. You can change the course of someone's life. Someone's life. The guy can start driving a taxi, Uber, so many things. The kids, they, and they're legal here. But nobody's thinking, okay, I can let me take that book, Rules of the Road, and let's just translate it in three different Rules languages. Of the road. Yeah, I right? That book, yeah. wow. Still, it's the same book people use. <laughs> wow. Can I can I can I just take that book and translate that into Somali? Can I translate that in in, in into Arabic? Can I do it in, into Burmese? Can I do it into Farsi? Four or five in Hindi and Urdu, whatever, and put it out there so the people can see it, they can read it. And you know what? I'm willing to even publish it if somebody does it. Yeah. I'm willing to take that project and say, you know what, we're going to have a thousand of each. Whoever wants to come and study, come and study. Take this book, study it. You will know. Yeah. In this day and age, I mean, we could put everything online too. I'm everything online. Just, so much. Especially, of I've never thought about that. You know, uh, this is actually funny, but uh, it's, it's, it shouldn't. But my mom's been actually trying to get her license. <laughs> For the last 20 years. Since 96, man. Hey, see? <laughs> <laughs> Why? Probably language. And maybe I'm a bad son, but I've just never... Uh, she, I mean, it's the book. That's the biggest it's the hurdle. Book. It's, it's the, the book. <laughs> so many of the uh, refugees go to... That's a simple project. But you know how many lives you'll change for that with that? Just simple project. I changed wow. my life. I wouldn't have to take her everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, think about that. Yeah. You're going to get. Put, you're gonna uh, make somebody able to put food on the table for simple translation work. It's less than 10 pages long, man. 10 pages long. If somebody does that and say, boom, and you put that in the market, people will read it. And you, simple things. Um, do, you, do you have plans like this? Do you, do you, yes. I mean, this isn't something you thought about. Yes. So what do you do? Do you, do you talk to actually, people? Actually, that idea just came in now. Oh, okay. really? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Wow. Actually, that came in uh, day before Isn't yesterday because uh, yesterday, day before yesterday, we were talking about, we were talking to one of the guys and said, hey, man, why don't you, because he's get he's, he works uh, eight hours, nine hours a day. He makes $1,400 a month. I said, how do you do that, man? How do you survive? I don't know, brother. I don't know English and you know, I can drive, but I drove 20 years in Malaysia, but I don't know how to, it's, I'm scared to take that exam because I don't know how to read this and how to do that. Then I thought, why not turn, m- do something in, in, in Burmese, put together this thing in Burmese. And then Arabic, Farsi, uh, Farsi because Afghani, a lot of Afghani refugees are there, they speak. Mm-hmm. And some of these languages that we can provide and you put that out there. Right? And there's a lot of, tra- if once you do that, there's a lot of translation work that needs to be done. Also, there's a humongous, humongous, humongous for all those scholars out there. Hint. Uh, we need, <laughs> we need a lot of, of, especially, we need material in Burmese language. This is something, I mean, it was amazing for me because a lot of the people did not know, they don't know about Islam. Simple things. They'll just say, I believe in the Nabi, for instance. I'll believe in the Nabi. Who's the Nabi? I don't know. And they can't say the whole name, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The youth, many of them cannot, they don't know the name. But many of them can speak Burmese very well. Can I translate simple books in Burmese for the Burmese youth? Now, can we get that to Burma too? Can we translate simple things of Aqidah and things like this? Uh, no more than let's say 15 pages a nice book on the Aqidah put it together translate it in Burma and, and send it to Burma hmm. now I have actual contacts inside Burma I have uh, in uh, contacts inside Arkan where these Buddhists are slaughtering the Muslims Arkan is where? Arkan is where the where the city where the, that village is where okay. the Buddhists are burning Muslims and it's in uh, Burma Okay. we have access to go inside Wow. actually one of the projects next project we're working on is how to get things inside inside Burma remember till now uh, nobody has been able to get to that area maybe very very few people individuals have been being able to get into Arkan where they can actually get the aid there I was talking to the families and I said I want to get aid inside there if I can get there I want to go there they said we can make that happen because they have their still they have their family members there still somehow aid gets to them so if there are people who are serious, who say, okay, you know what? I would like to get this much amount of medicine from Malaysia, from Malaysia into this area. There are now ways that we can do that. It doesn't have to be that you yourself go in there. Like when I talked to them, they said, no, you don't go in there just because of your beard. Mm. <laughs> they told me that very open. They said, look, do you want the project to get done or do you, the, or do you, do you have to be you who go there? I said, no, no, no. doesn't matter me now. Can we get this done? They said, we can get you to Rangoon. 
But from Rangoon to Arakan, we can't get you there. Where's Rangoon? Burma, the city, the capital city of uh, oh, Burma. Okay. Right? We can't get you from there because those guys, the moment they see you, they're going to say no. <laughs> but you can go to Rangoon. <laughs> they can go to Rangoon. And it's from Rangoon, beard. you can do what you want. It's a beard. It's the, oh, you they know you're Muslim. the style Muslim. now in the United States. Everyone's growing a beard. You should tell them. Right. Oh, yeah, yeah. Now, especially. <laughs> yeah, so are. now, uh, there are many ways. There are many things that we can do. So, and, and as I said, now we can even get aid there. But uh, we can buy in Rangoon, by the way. You can buy a the medicine, especially is what they need. You can buy in Rangoon, and you have people now that are willing to take from there to where it needs to go. So that's another thing that you can do. When you do the work, uh, you know, Allah opens doors one after the other. Fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is, as Allah azawajal said, you know, fear Allah azawajal, and Allah will open the doors for you from places you cannot imagine. You know, that's. Haythu la la Right? And uh, but fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that again is the ideological understanding of things. When you know, fear Allah azawajal, Allah will open the doors. Fear Allah azawajal, Allah will provide you from places you can't imagine. Fear Allah azawajal, Allah will open the doors from Khada and Al-Ard. Allah azawajal, this is, Allah will open doors. And same thing and advice to you guys here. Don't worry about what people have to say. Most mm-hmm. people talk anyway. That's their job. Let the people talk. You do the work. And it's khalilun min khalilun min khalil. Sah? This is few of the few of the few do the work. And if somebody even, I think, if even one person learns something, benefits, and someday does something, let's say, if somebody heard something saying, okay, I can get to Rangoon, and from Rangoon, I can get that uh, product inside there, and they want to contact me, they can actually contact me, and I'll tell you, we can get you in contact with families in those areas that can get things inside. Let's say if that happens. You already succeeded. You already mm-hmm. succeeded. Somebody can come yeah. and say, because of that talk, that podcast uh, you know that was set up by a few people because of that I heard that talk and you know what people in certain areas where nobody thought it can get in there got there mm. yeah. thank you man it's very inspiring and so don't ever belittle your work and as I said who cares about what people say I don't think we could end it off on a better note um, how do people get in touch with you do you have uh, a website Facebook Twitter yes we have a website islamicoasis.org uh, we have Facebook uh Islamic Oasis by itself, non-profit organization. We have Islamic Oasis Save a Life campaign. Tax deductible uh, organization. We are a tax deductible, tax exempt organization, uh, non-profit. Yeah. Um, so an email would be Shirazi S H I R A Z I Shirazi at Islamic Oasis one word dot org. You can go to you know six three zero seven zero nine three seven eight three. That's my phone number. And believe me, leave a message. We'll get you somehow. One final okay. question. Sorry, guys. I just have to ask because somebody asked me about Islamic Oasis. Do you guys accept zakat when people want on, on a of yearly course. basis? So uh, of okay, course. of course we okay. accept zakat, sadaqa, um, anything that you can give us. That's uh, legal, please <laughs> <laughs> get, it, get it to us because uh, there's a huge need out there. There's a huge right. need. As as and the thing is, needs only grow the more you work. It's not that you know needs don't they don't get smaller mm. they get bigger and bigger and bigger because you realize how much more you have to do and please the rules of the road idea somebody please do it <laughs> if I don't do it I'll, really I'll take on that project yeah, please man Inshallah. if you're serious we'll provide you whatever it is that you need to do please uh-huh. do it check online to see if they're actually available in any other language first of all uh, if it is let's say if it's not let's put that together if it's available let's see how we can make that common. You can get a lot of people, help them a lot. Of, you, know, you can help a lot of people put food on their table with the help of Allah. Uh, Muhammad, you know, thanks a lot for coming, man. I mean, honestly. Yeah, I, 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 w- uh, I mean, this this could honestly go on for a few hours, but uh, inshallah, we'll have you on the show again. We will. Inshallah. We have to do this again. Inshallah. We only covered, like, we only scratched an eighth of the surface. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have a lot to talk about, inshallah. Yeah, inshallah. Yeah. I mean, we, yeah, thank you very much, brothers. Uh, you guys can reach us at, at Gmail, uh, the Mad Mum Lukes, D H E M A D M A M L U K S at gmail.com or our Twitter, our Twitter handle. That's a bad name, by the way. <laughs> at gmail.com <laughs> 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 or Twitter uh, at the Mad Mum Lukes. Um, we also have a Facebook page, uh, the same at Mad Mum Lukes. Make sure you like us. Yeah. We out. <laughs>